Welcome. I am Andrew Parasoliti, Executive Director of the IISS US and Corresponding Director, IISS Middle East. Before introducing our panelists, let me offer an introductory thought about our topic, U.S. politics in the American foreign policy debate. As a consumer of news and information, I am struck that the debates in American foreign policy, like the ones that we are having here today at the IISS Global Strategic Review, are mostly on the margins of U.S. politics, and especially on the margins of its main event, the run-up to the 2012 elections. The deep economic crisis in the United States, 9.1 percent unemployment, a projected $1.3 trillion deficit, 1 percent GDP growth in the last quarter, and fatigue with the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan have Americans focused on matters at home and more cautious than ever about entanglements and especially military entanglements abroad. With regard to Libya, the administration could not have gotten an authorization to use force from the U.S. House of Representatives and therefore the Congress. Both Republicans and Democrats on the right and the left joined in questioning U.S. involvement in the NATO military action. This is well documented in one of our ISS strategic comments. Regarding Afghanistan, a Quinnipiac poll last month reported that 58 percent of Americans said the U.S., quote, should not be involved, unquote, in Afghanistan. And with regard to the, US, to the withdrawal of U.S. forces from Iraq, it seems it is only the military policy and strategy elites in the U.S. who are concerned about the size and mission of U.S. troops in Iraq after 2011 in terms of U.S politics. There is mostly support, if not relief, for President Obama following through on his campaign commitment for a responsible exit from Iraq. So foreign affairs will register hardly at all in U.S. electoral politics, and when it does, it is likely to do so to the advantage of the President, who can claim on his watch the killing of Osama bin Laden. This is not necessarily to say that the U.S. is in the midst of a grand shift in strategic posture doctrine or is on a path to isolation or has forsworn indefinitely the use of force to defend its interests or its homeland. It is instead to say that there is presently an attitude and inclination in the United States to look inward, that it is rooted in economic uncertainty and the lack of a constituency for wars without end. This trend is evident in one form or another across the U.S. political spectrum, which is why Republicans will have a different, difficult time scoring in political terms on President Obama with regard to foreign affairs. Let me now introduce our panelists in the order that they will speak. My colleague, Dr. Dana Allen, is the IISS Senior Fellow for U.S. Foreign Policy and Transatlantic Affairs and editor of Survival, as well as the author of a forthcoming ISS Adelphi book with Dr. Eric Jones on whether the U.S. Uh, will continue to be or should be the world's policeman. Ambassador Robert Blackwell is the Henry A. Kissinger Senior Fellow for U.S. Foreign Policy at the Council on Foreign Relations a member of both the IISS Council and Trustees, and among the wisest and most accomplished of American diplomats and strategists. And Mr. Philip Stevens is Associate Editor and Chief Political Commentator for the Financial Times and one of the keenest observers of U.S. politics from across the ocean. So with that, let me turn to Dana Allen. Thank you, Andrew. Our topic uh, being foreign policy in the U.S. elections, I, I don't want to stray too far from the political, but I will try to touch briefly on the question of whether there is something like an Obama doctrine that Republican candidates can challenge and American voters can either reject or ratify. If American voters do either, however, it will only be in the most indirect manner because, as Andrew just said, this election, like most elections, but even more so, will be decided on the basis of the domestic concerns of the American people. 
which means, I think, as Andrew also said, above all, the still dire state of the American economy. The economic problem puts President Obama's reelection very much in doubt. Even though he remains personally very popular, and even though his policies in the components are more popular than the Republican alternatives. But the economic problem overshadows and infuses every other issue, including every foreign policy issue, and what I will call an Obama doctrine. Now, doctrine is probably too grand a word for what is arguably just a conventionally realist foreign policy. But still, I would say from a determined withdrawal from Iraq to the constrained escalation in Afghanistan, to the limited engagement in support of the Libya operation, to the stepped-up drone strikes and killing of Osama bin Laden in Pakistan, I do think you can discern a kind of doctrine, at least um, servable for the purposes of political debate. It's a doctrine of strategic restraint, which is to say muscular but more narrowly focused pursuit of American interests. It rests on Obama's apparent conviction that the United States has become strategically overextended and needs a process of managed retrenchment that will help it achieve an economic restoration at home. This is a kind of small c conservatism that was best expressed at West Point in December 2009, where President Obama announced an escalation of the war in Afghanistan, but also said, and I'll quote him at some length, as president, I refuse to set goals that go beyond our responsibility, our means, or our interests. And I must weigh all of the challenges that our nation faces. I don't have the luxury of committing to just one. Indeed, I'm mindful of the words of President Eisenhower, who, in discussing our national security, said, each proposal must be weighed in the light of a broader consideration, the need to maintain balance in and among national programs. Hence, President Obama escalated in Afghanistan at the same time he set clear limits to the extent of our commitment. Hence, the United States provided the enabling sinews of the international action against Gaddafi, but would not weigh in with overwhelming American power. Now look, the drawbacks of applying military power at the same time that you advertise its limits are obvious. But a big, fractious, and transparent democracy like the United States cannot easily bluff about the magnitude of its interest in any particular conflict. And I would go further in, in, in speaking about Libya. Um, if we take seriously any idea of a kind of nascent international community embracing, for example, a responsibility to protect, then occasions of leading from behind to report a poor schmuck's unfortunate joke are inevitable. Because not every place where the international community needs American power is a place where the supreme US interests are at stake. Libya is one clear example. And one might argue, uh, based on uh, polling of the American people that, uh, part, partly on polling of the American people that um, Andrew referred to, one might argue that Afghanistan, after the death of bin Laden and the degradation of Al Qaeda, is another. Could the United States have done a Better job more quickly if it hadn't let France and Britain take the lead in, in Libya? Maybe. But I think a determination to share the burden stems from a recognition that the United States has to manage a process of relative decline in its uh, power vis-a-vis -vis other world powers. Now, for reasons going well beyond domestic politics, no American president, including this one, is going to be talking about American decline. And the word may be analytically as well as politically incorrect. And yet, and this is a long story, no doubt discussed in many sessions at um, IISS annual conferences, relative decline, I repeat, relative decline is both inevitable and benign insofar as, as it's the inevitable consequence of a strategy that America has pursued since World War II, which is to say helping other countries become richer and more successful. I suppose the United States could pursue a goal of trying to keep China mired in poverty but I don't know what a strategy for pursuing that goal would look like. I fear it could have dangerous consequences, and I feel it would be immoral and un-American. Relative American decline is a benign future compared to likely alternatives, but it's not unproblematic unpro strategically, because it suggests that over the long term, American strategic, strategic hegemony is going to be difficult to sustain. The long term is the long term, of course. Right now, the US spends about as much on defense as the rest of the world combined. When it comes to deterring war on the Korean Peninsula, or God forbid, fighting that war, uh, 
the United States remains the indispensable nation, which I think is how, which is how this administration, like other administrations, sees things. But when it comes to determining, rather than just influencing, how women are treated in Afghanistan, I think this administration recognized the, limit, recognizes the, the limits of American power. Now, for Obama, a corollary to this strategic restraint has been a certain rhetorical restraint and a concern for restoring rather than just asserting the legitimacy, legitimacy of American power. That legitimacy was strained, if not squandered, in Iraq, at Abu Ghraib, and with the waterboarding of terrorist suspects. Rhetorical constraint has been a conscious policy when Iranian di dissidents were risking their lives in the streets of Tehran, and more recently regarding the Arab awakening, because this president believes, and I think he believes it sincerely, that self-empowerment is preferable to the accusation of American meddling. And it is this restraint and this approach to legitimacy that has provided up until now the main foreign policy target for Republican candidates. The president has been accused of conducting a grand apology tour. He is accused of not believing in American exceptionalism. Um, the, here into Alia, the, the ostentatious religiosity of American politics comes in handy because arguments in defense of American exceptionalism that proceed from logic, uh, like the one President Obama offered in Strasbourg early in his term, are dismissed by candidates who have no trouble asserting that American exceptionalism was and remains a divine gift. Another useful aspect of the exceptionalism attack is that it fits seamlessly with the Republican attack on Obama's domestic policies. Here, too, Obama is accused of renouncing American exceptionalism and trying to convert the United States into a version of Europe, this barren, socialist, totalitarian dystopia that you can see for yourselves if any of you are brave enough to step outside this hotel. So far, I've spoken in terms of doctrine and philosophy and rhetoric because it's mainly in these general terms that foreign policy has been debated in the campaign so far. I'd like to go into detail about more specific foreign policy consequences of a Republican or Democratic victory a year from now. I don't have a lot of time, so let me just flag three issues which I hope we might visit in Q&A, and, Q and they're really just examples. There are many more. First, at the outset of his term, President Obama tried to definitively renounce torture and to, to end the debate about it. Many of his opponents have insisted on keeping the debate open in a way I think that is deeply inimical to American interests. Second, climate change, where I will just observe how infuriating and frightening it is to watch Republican candidates engage in Galileo-like renunciations of their previous science-based views. Third, Israel-Palestine, where I will simply assert that to my ears, President, President Obama sounds like a better friend to Israel than any Republican candidate, a friend being defined as someone who tries to stop his friend from the self-harming behavior rather than extolling and encouraging it. But I'll leave that for Q&A because I need to take just three minutes to talk about what will, will in fact be the big issues of this election. First and by far most important is the, un is the unemployment emergency in the United States. We are trying to get out of a balance sheet recession, the worst since World War II. Individuals have too much debt and are trying properly to save rather than spend, so the government has to step in and fill the hole. The government did so at the outset of the administration and averted a much greater depression, but it wasn't enough. Thursday night, the president proposed $450 billion in further spending and tax breaks, which would help, but what, which won't happen because the Republicans now say they don't believe in Keynesian solutions. This disbelief in Keynesian solutions fits snugly with their narrow political interest, which is to delay economic recovery until after President Obama is defeated. Please ask me in Q&A exactly what I'm apply, implying about Republican motives here, because the answer is slightly more complicated than it may sound. The second issue is the federal debt. This is a long-term problem. The United States is not bankrupt in any common sense meaning of the term. It can borrow money at very low rates of interest. But the long-term problem is serious. The solution will have to com involve a combination of defense cuts, or at least restraint in defense spending, restraint in the growth of health care costs, and tax increases. Now, regarding the first two of these three items, 
It is the case that healthcare spending is going to be more important than defense because it is the growth in these costs that is the main driver of the long-term deficit. Still, defense is the biggest item of discretionary spending, and I think it is just politically implausible that you can cut or even restrain spending on Medicare, which is government-funded health care for the elderly, without touching defense. And I think I'm saying more or less the same thing that Aaron Friedberg was saying in the last session. The biggest problem is taxes. And here we come to the surreal and frankly terrifying crisis of American politics played out in this summer's hostage negotiations over the fe federal debt ceiling. The medium-term deficit problem would be mostly erased if we re returned to Clinton-era tax rates. But all, almost every member, every Republican member of the United States Congress has signed a pledge that he or she will never, under any circumstances, vote for a bill that increases net revenue to the U.S. government. I said that correctly. And they mean it. President Obama, in talks with House Speaker John Boehner this summer, offered to reach, reach a huge debt reduction deal of almost $4 trillion that would have entailed $3 in spending cuts for every $1 in increased revenue. Boehner walked away. And so the deal raising the debt limit entailed a comparatively tiny reduction in the long-term debt. So to conclude on a very pessimistic note, I will say just two things. First, although, I don't, although you don't really see it in the current campaign rhetoric, I can conceive of a President Romney pursuing pragmatic, sensible policies on a range of issues, including those I've met, some of those I've mentioned, such as climate change and Israel-Palestine. What I cannot imagine is that he will go against this fanatical Republican orthodoxy on taxes. Second, if I'm correct in this fear, the relative decline of American power that I described earlier as inevitable and manageable could turn into a real decline that is both avoidable and tragic, and it could happen very quickly. Thank you. Just uh, in, in the interest of um, ISS uh, putting some facts on the table, uh, I would just note that the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, misnamed the Stimulus Program, uh, was passed in the Congress when the Repu with no Republican support. And since that was passed, $800 billion in deficit spending, we've gone from 8.2% unemployment in February 2009 to 9.1% unemployment as we sit here today. Uh, the budget deficit was $455 billion in 2008. It is projected to be $1.3 trillion this year. So uh, if we're going to blame uh, the Republicans, let's blame them when uh, they have uh, some role in what's happened. But since Obama passed his signature economic program, unemployment has gone up. Ambassador Blackwell. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, if I counted correctly, there were 12 things that the first speaker said I don't agree with. Um, but I'm not going to address any of them because I don't think I was invited here to give a campaign speech. So instead, I'm actually going to address the topic. Um, and uh, I'm going to start like this. Um, we all know uh, what the, and it's been uh, adverted to earlier in our deliberations, that the most important strategic intersection uh, between U.S. domestic politics and American uh, foreign policy surrounds the question of whether the United States political system will cope successfully with the U.S. debt and deficit challenges or rather fail to do so thus weakening over time U.S. power projection externally. Nobody knows the answer to that question. And so I'm not going to dwell on it. Rather, what I would like to look at, I hope analytically, uh, and uh, without uh, a domestic uh, political orientation from one party or the other, is uh, the more proximate issues uh, connecting our domestic politics and our foreign policy. 
I want to begin with two quotes, two of my favorite ones, about uh, democracy and uh, uh, foreign policy. The first is de Tocqueville, who said, foreign policy does not require the use of any of the good qualities peculiar to democracy, but does demand the cultivation of almost all those which it lacks. And my second is from uh, George Kennan. That one was 1835. This one's 1950. Kennan, I sometimes wonder whether in this respect a democracy is not uncomfortably similar to one of those prehistoric monsters with a body as long as this room and a brain the size of a pin. He lies there in his comfortable primeval mud and pays little attention to his environment. He is slow to wrath. In fact, you practically have to whack his tail off to make him aware that his interests are being disturbed. But once he grasps this, he lays about him with such blind determination that he not only destroys his adversary, but largely wrecks his native habitat. Uh, as a Kissingerian, I have some sympathy with both those uh, comments. Uh, I want to agree and skip over what I was going to say about uh, the uh, domination of economic issues uh, in uh, uh, the next electoral cycle, because it's been well put by others. And I'm also not going to discuss the current foreign policy political debate across the aisle and between the parties for four reasons. The first is that myself, I've been deeply involved in three presidential elections uh, with two winners and one loser. Uh, it's, by the way, better uh, to win the next day. Uh, I can uh, testify uh, that uh, the opposition, those not in office, whatever party, from either party, always find virtually nothing whatsoever good to say about the politics of the sitting president, no matter how successful the uh, foreign policy the president is. So. Uh, I'm not uh, uh, paying too much attention to that. Second, the current foreign policy debate within the Republican Party, it's lively, has all to do with affecting the Republican base, not with uh, the uh, country at large because they have to win enough primaries to get the nomination. Third, what presidential candidates say during campaigns often have very little to do with the way uh, they govern. I wonder how many of us, maybe you did, I certainly did, thought that President Obama would escalate the uh, covert war against uh, terrorism and escalate the ground war in Afghanistan. So, uh, uh, and then fourth, the president election, election is still 14 months away and much is gonna happen in the world between now and then. So here's what I'd like to do. Uh, I'd like to first, based on a, a careful examination of polling data, uh, say what I think are several factors that will influence American international behavior uh, in the years ahead. As has already been said, and I'm going to skip right on over, there's a great preoccupation in the country for obvious reasons, including some of the uh, statistics our chairman just mentioned, on domestic economic uh, issues. Uh, the renewal of America, as some have said, and especially its fiscal foundations. Uh, just to give you some sense of how overwhelming that preoccupation is, and I'm going to quote polls here, and I just want to assure you, they're all uh, uh, in the center of the polling. I don't pick any outliers here. Uh, recently, uh, CNN asked, uh, which are the most important issues facing the country today? Okay. Um, and here was the answer. The economy, 60% of the people. Uh, federal budget deficit, 16. Health care, 9. And Iraq, Afghanistan, and Libya altogether, 5% of the American people thought those were uh, issues uh, of uh, primary importance. Uh, just to uh, give you some data. Second, um, I think, and again, this was implied by our chairman in his opening remarks, uh, 
There's uh, now formidable public opposition to the employment of U.S. ground troops overseas in large-scale combat. Lots of polls would show this and do show this. And uh, my favorite quote on that subject is actually by the Secretary of Defense, uh, Bob Gates, uh, in February at, Re at West Point, when he said the following, which is really quite remarkable for a Secretary of Defense to say, and this was in his prepared remark, so he didn't, uh, it wasn't spontaneous. Any future defense secretary who advises the president to again send a big American land army into Asia or the Middle East or Africa should have his head examined, as General MacArthur so delicately put it. And the polling in America uh, demonstrates clearly the American people uh, agree with that. Uh, third, uh, there's going to be fewer resources available for foreign uh, assistance, uh, which uh, is pretty paltry anyway. Uh, fourth, uh, less emphasis on an aggressive export of U.S. democratic values, more polling data, recent polling data. The question was, do you think it sh to the American uh, people, it, do, do you think it should or should not be the role of the United States to promote the establishment of democratic governments in other countries. It should be the role, 32 percent, no, 64 percent. That's on uh, the export of uh, democracy. Um, uh, next, polling suggests, and I could go into the details but won't for reasons of time, that the American public and political class are now substantially more interested in Asia than in Europe, and that's demonstrated in a variety of ways. Uh, next, Israel, and this was mentioned earlier, uh, will be the most important pillar of U.S. policy in the Middle East, like it or not, like it or not. What I was struck by is uh, uh, Governor Romney stated a few weeks ago that in the Middle East, we're pressuring our closest Israel to make concessions while putting almost no pressure on the Palestinians. This to an administration which, by my calculation on three separate occasions, backed down uh, on settlement policy with respect to Israel. So I think that captures it. Now, as I head for the finish line, I want to give you six uh, uh, scenarios here, hypotheticals which could occur and, at least at the moment, give you uh, how the American people feel about them. Uh, and uh, I'll begin with uh, the domestic economy. Um, I will say more about this in a minute, but uh, as our chairman said, uh, I think there's no sign the U.S. public or politicians are becoming isolationists. Uh, and in the day-to-day, -day, I think, uh, American diplomacy in its process isn't going to change very much. But as uh, several people have observed, the U.S. public really has very little interest now in foreign policy except if it intrudes into their daily lives. And that primarily would be, uh, for most Americans, through a terrorist attack. Defense spending is going to be cut substantially, no doubt about it. Uh, and the only question is how big and how, how deep. Second. Um, with the trends that I've described earlier, I think that if the public's opinion is taken into account in a substantial way by the political class, uh, the ground combat missions in Iraq and in Afghanistan, uh, if they are some in Iraq, will be gone by 2014 at the latest. Uh, the American people are now against this. Our chairman quoted uh, figures, and there are many along the same lines. Uh, the very latest poll I saw uh, suggested that 63 percent of the American people want a total withdrawal immediately from Iraq, no matter what happens there. And in Af Afghanistan, 73 percent uh, supported substantial tens of thousand withdrawals this summer, and 60 percent want an immediate withdrawal, total military withdrawal. Third, if the U.S. is hit by another deadly terrorist attack and knows the country of origin, it would use major military force against that country, but not, not put significant boots on the ground 
and would not engage in nation building again. Uh, again, the polls all show that this, uh, the American people would support an air campaign which was lengthy in character, but uh, not boots on the ground. And uh, Leon Panetta, our Secretary of Defense, gave a speech two days ago, a memorial 9-11 speech, uh, and in it he said, quote, if you attack us, we will come get you, but not we will come build your nation. For, uh, with respect to Libya, uh, my own judgment is, and again the polling uh, supports this, that if there's another tragedy, something like Libya, uh, the U.S. would probably do less than, they've done, than it's done in Libya militarily and perhaps stay entirely out of the fight in March, when uh, the alliance was debating and the major uh, uh, European countries were debating what to do, uh, the polling was consistent that 70 percent of the American people wanted no U.S. military engagement regarding Libya. And then uh, next, China. If you look at the polling on China, it's a pretty grim picture of the future of U.S.-China relations. And uh, I think it's likely that at least the public and political sentiment uh, in the United States regarding China is going to become ever more critical. I'll just, uh, and one of the reasons for that is a poll I'll now quote as I'm almost finished, uh, which is uh, a recent poll asking the American people, do you think this century will be an American century or a Chinese century? Uh, Thirty-eight percent said American century, and forty-three percent said Chinese century. Uh, that's the American people, and that's a recipe for more criticism about China, especially its its uh, economic pol policies. If Iran appears to be close to acquiring nuclear weapons capability, a uh, majority of the American public, at least uh, under current polling, would support an American air attack on Iranian facilities. Uh, the latest poll, 64% favored military strikes to end the Iranian nuclear program. Uh, now, uh, to sum up, uh, finally, uh, uh, and uh, I hope this is uh, somewhat reassuring, there is, in my opinion, uh, no evidence that there's going to be the adoption by the American public and political elite of neo-isolationism, no belief that America is in decline relative or otherwise, and no diminution in the overriding belief in American exceptionalism. Uh, a question recently asked, would, how do you think about the role of the United States in trying to solve international problems? Should the U.S. take the leading role, a major role, or a minor role? 50 percent leading role, 25 percent major role. So the American people have no uh, inclination uh, to come home America. In the last poll, I'll quote, uh, about American exceptionalism, uh, the question was, because of the United States history and its constitution, do you think the U.S. has a unique character that makes it the greatest country in the world, or don't you think so? <laughs> think so, 80 <laughs> percent. Don't think so, 18 percent. Or, as Henry Kissinger has observed, quote, for other nations, utopia is a blessed past, never to be recovered. For Americans, it's always just beyond the horizon. Thank you. Thank you. Philip Stevens. Uh, thank you very much. Um, my role on this panel is to give uh, the European view of uh, emerging US uh, foreign policy. Um, before that, I just wanted to actually to thank uh, Adam and uh, John for inviting me here. It's been uh, uh, a very rich, uh, and dare one say it, intense couple of days, I think. Um, someone said, uh, my brain is almost full. So is my notebook. Um, 
some of you will know uh, what columnists do. We uh, come to events like this, uh, listen to clever people like you, steal your ideas, and then present them as our own. <laughs> but the European view, I mean, there's a slight problem here in that, of course, there isn't a European view. Those of you who spend time on this continent will know that it's a pretty fractured and fragmented place these days. You can see that in the failure of governments to get to grips with the crisis of the Eurozone. Now that, on one level, is a very serious economic crisis, a misdesigned single currency, but I think beyond, beneath the, uh, the troubles that governments of the Eurozone have had over the last 18 months is really lies an existential question. Uh, the European Union doesn't quite know what it's for anymore. I think we've seen on Libya, too, uh, the fractures. It wasn't just that uh, Germany preferred the company of its major export markets at the United Nations. Um, Poland uh, declined uh, to contribute. I think we've seen in the failure of the Lisbon Treaty to generate a coherent, cohesive European foreign policy. As I say, this existential question, what's the European Union for? So what I offer you today is not so much a European perspective, uh, but the perspective of a despairing European. Despairing, that's to say, of his own continent. Uh, like any good Frenchman, I'd like to make trois points. The first is, as we've heard, it seems self-evident that the US will draw back from the world and again, as we've heard, that retrenchment will be felt most acutely in Europe. The opening years of the present century saw many Europeans resentful of US power. France referred to the hyperpuissance, but they weren't alone. Remember Gerhard Schroeder joined with Jacques Chirac in cuddling up to Vladimir Putin and proposing a new poll to counter US power. Well, in my view, the next decade, the coming, the present decade, will see Europeans lamenting America's relative, and I, un I underline relative, weakness. The second point is that a hobbled America makes it far less likely that we will see a remodeling and refurbishment of the post-war multilateral order. We know that there's going to be more competition. There is indeed more competition in global affairs. That's the inevitable uh, consequence of new powers emerging. One might have hoped that that would be accompanied by greater cooperation more global governance. With a weaker America, I think that's unlikely. Uh, the third point I'd make is that Europe is unlikely to rise to the challenge of this hobbled America, and this augurs badly for the future of the transatlantic alliance. Uh, Libya has been a diplomatic and political success, I think, for Britain and France but only seven or eight of the European members of NATO, by my count, agreed to operate at the sharp end of that operation. And Britain has now joined the ranks of the big defense cutters. If you talk privately to Britain's military chiefs, they'll tell you that if the Lib Libyan uprising had started perhaps a year later, they wouldn't have had the wherewithal to conduct the operation. So 
two minutes more on each of these three points. We've heard about the economic and political constraints on the projection of US power in coming years. Now, I'm not an American declinist, and actually nor do I think that the trajectory of the rise of the new powers, China particularly, but also others, is going to be linear or trouble-free. I think it's too easy uh, at events like this to, to imagine that while the West will be troubled, uh, the rest will uh, are guaranteed a trouble-free world. But as we've heard, the US is both weary of foreign entanglements and won't be able to afford its present level of overseas commitments. American presidents, this one and the next, I'd say, uh, are, want to fix things at home. What struck me in the recent political debates in Washington is that during the argument over the debt ceiling, for example, Republicans accepted almost without protest the prospect of defense cuts in the trade-off with Democrats on social security spending. The pres to an outsider, it seems that to many Republicans, and this isn't a partisan point, that tax cuts are prized above military spending. I think it's also striking how President Obama's plans for a drawdown of troops from Afghanistan attracted a little more than a murmur. I think John McCain, one or two others uh, from congressional Republicans, more than a murmur of complaint. Uh, that's not to say there should have been more, but I just think it was a striking thing. And again, as has been said, the White House would have failed to get congressional support for intervention in Libya. Now, by everyone else's standards, and particularly Europe's standards, the US, of course, retains and will retain a huge capacity to intervene. But as again, as we've heard, that reach is now being contested in the diplomatic as well as the military arenas. And again, as we've heard, it seems inevitable to a European that the US will want to concentrate its resources in Asia. We'll see a shift eastwards from Europe and the greater Middle East to the area of greatest contestability, East Asia. The second point, we know the world's becoming multipolar, but how multilateral will it be? Well, I think it was possible a few years ago as one looked at American strength and leadership to imagine Washington leading a strategy to refurbish the uh, creation uh, of American leaders in 1945 to 1950. But in a sense, we've been present, I think, at the destruction. The great tragedy of Iraq, and I speak as someone who was equivocal, not against the war, but the great tragedy of Iraq, I think, is that it sat the energy, prestige, and moral authority of the US. Those things would have been needed, I think, for a venture to refurbish the multilateral order. The US could have taken great strides in that direction during the 90s or in the opening years of the present century, but the opportunity was lost. It strikes me that the administration says all the right things about leveraging US influence to widen and deepen global governance. But in truth, it has neither the political will nor the international authority to do so. So the world's going to become more fragmented, more regional, and more Hobbesian. That seems to me to make it inevitable that it'll become more unstable and unpredictable. And as the IISS points out in its latest strategic survey, will witness more regionalization of security policy and more coalitions of the willing and the available. The landscape will more closely resemble that of 19th century Europe than of the second half of the 20th century. Which brings me back to the third point of Europe and the cause of my depression. 
As I said, at first glance, the Franco-British cooperation in the Libyan campaign was encouraging. It's not often that you hear a French president lauding NATO, nor indeed a British prime minister these days talking about how closely and cooperatively uh, he's working with his French, with the French president. But the operation, as far as Europe concerned, seems to me to be more a, more a last hurrah than a harbinger of a more coherent European defense capability. As everyone knows, although President Obama professed to be taking a, a back seat, the US provided all the vital infrastructure for the campaign. The Europeans, or at least the British, ran out of ammunition. The sole French aircraft carrier had to hobble back to port. And as I said, the British were stretched, I think, uh, to, it, to capacity to deploy enough planes for what was a pretty modest operation. Now, earlier this year, I wrote a column for the FT uh, saying with the headline, I didn't write it, but it was, I thought it was a good headline. Uh, the Yanks are going home. Hooray. Now, the hooray was not to say, not to convey any sense of anti-Americanism, but rather was my uh, expression of hope that Europeans might at last be shaken out of their inertia and think more closely about sustaining their own military capabilities if the US did indeed began, begin to disengage. Not a bit of it. The complacency in Europe is seen strikingly, I think, as visibly in the new Europe of former communist states as in the old Europe of the West. I was speaking recently in London with a visiting prime minister from one of the former communist states who explained to me that uh, the United States uh, didn't understand that Russia was still a menace in that part of the world and had made a terrible mistake in trading the neighborhood um, for the reset in US-Russian relations. Uh, I'm afraid my reply was, well, it was perfectly obvious that Russia wasn't a menace in any respect whatsoever. And I knew this because this prime minister's government had just announced the third cut in its defense expenditure in the past two years. Uh, that didn't win me a great friend. But since we're in Switzerland, or in Geneva, uh, the trouble I see is that everyone wants a Swiss foreign policy. You hear many politicians, as I say, talk about the menace from Russia, but refuse to spend any money. Many European governments will soon have defense budgets which approach 1% of GDP, national income. And as Bob Gates reminded us earlier this year, in what I consider to be an excellent valedictory speech at NATO, there's simply no logic in any more in the US bearing 75% of NATO. But everyone in Europe wants to spell, spend less. So my conclusion, and I was going to apologize for my pessimism, but I don't think uh, I'll apologize for it. I think it's justified. It's a simple conclusion. Europe will come to regret America's retreat from its role as the world's policeman as much as not so long ago it resented Washington's hegemony. Thank you. Okay, the floor is uh, now open for question. Uh, again, the points for concise question uh, and comments. I'll begin to get a list and we'll take around the questions and come back to the panel. Jean-Louis Gergerin. Uh, a small remark. First, uh, in uh, the Roman Empire, the emperor who decided to manage retrenchment policy first, Emperor Adrian, was also an intellectual, just like President Obama. Uh, coming back to uh, the future, 
Uh, I would like to ask both uh, uh, Bob Blackwell and Dana whether they believe that the, new, the next US administration, Republican or Democratic, would accept to, I would say, a de facto restructuring or reorganization of NATO in which uh, the intervention will be done by the uh, uh, Europeans, or some Europeans, a very limited number of Europeans, we know mainly the French and the British, but all the, uh, uh, the C4I, uh, communication, control, intelligence, uh, eventually special forces, will, the Americans will continue to be behind the scene to provide that as they did in Libya. Or do you think that uh, we have a risk of also a decline of this kind of US support in if, uh, in, if there is a need of new interventions. Thank you. Uh, Cho Kong. Thank you. Uh, my question to Ambassador Blackwell. What happens, uh, what will happen when a US which believes utopia is just over the horizon encounters a China which also believes that utopia is just over the horizon? Then bring in Phillips, what Philip Stevens said, that the rise of China will not be linear nor trouble-free. What happens then? Thank you. Uh, Mr. Wright. Question for Dr. Allen. Uh, it's very easy to make a compelling argument now uh, for retrenchment uh, with 9.1 percent unemployment. Isn't the real uh, politics perhaps is, is easy? Foreign policy is more difficult. Isn't the real challenge facing the political manager, uh, the one of managing the frustration that may occur in four years, eight years, when perhaps we hope the economy turns up, uh, when there is less unemployment, uh, and when there is a, uh, as almost inevitably will be the case given the course of American history in the post-war period, increasing frustration of the constraints that bind the United States and the potential for political candidates to emerge uh, calling for the United States to stand tall and uh, rid itself of the, uh, of the, of the constraints that have, uh, have kept it from carrying out what is seen as its natural role in the world. Baria Alamuddin. Thank you. Uh, I, I'd like to uh, pose my question to all the panel, please. Does the panel really believe that American foreign policy towards Israel, the unwavering support, damages its standing in not only the Arab world and the Muslim world, but across the world in general? And my next question is, how would they deal with a nuclear Iran vis-a-vis uh, -vis what uh, 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 Ambassador Blackwell said about the support they have in the States. Thank you. Let's take that first round of questions because there's, uh, there's, there's many big and important questions there on NATO, China, the emergence of a political candidate or force which would uh, campaign against the constraints of this era and policy toward Israel and the nuclear Iran, and we'll just go through uh, the panel. Dana? Well, if I understood, Jean-Louis, if I understood your question correctly, um, you're asking, would the United States be willing to see a perpetual pattern of operations like Libya, if that was where? Um, you know, I think it's difficult to generalize and extrapolate from one case. I mean, I think there was a, in, in this administration, there was a conscious idea that a crisis in range of European powers with more palpable and obvious European interests um, would at the cutting edge be handled by the Europeans and that would, that would be yes. So the answer is I think yes, if such a, but you know, the next crisis is not necessarily gonna look like this one. So it's hard to extrapolate it into a, uh, you know, a, an enduring pattern. But it was not unpalatable, it was in very much welcomed by the United States and I'm not quite even sure that um, a Republican administration would necessarily feel very differently about it. Uh, well, that's all I'll say about that. To, to, to the question about it's easy to make a compelling argument for retrenchment, I mean, let me just say something generally because I did choose my words carefully. Um, and I do not see a United States in retreat. Um, I see, a, or if it's in retreat, it's retreating to a position that is more or less what would its position before the Bush administration. Uh, 
I think the view of, I think I'm of the view of the Obama administration is the United States became overstretched in the last 10 years. Now there are, you know, there are longer budgetary uh, issues involving our very large defense budget that has been going on for a long time. Uh, but, you know, I think it's encapsulated perfectly in the line that Ambassador Blackwell quoted from um, Robert Gates. Um, the next president or the next secretary of defense who recommends, you know, a land war in the Middle East should have his head examined. Uh, and that is, um, you know, that's a pungent way of describing a view that we went too far. But it's not the whole American posture since World War II. It's the American posture in the last 10 years that is seen as an overreach. And the retreat, if you want to call it that, is not going to be you know, isolationism is a word that really has a specific meaning in the interwar period, and it doesn't really have much serious content in terms of what the United, any conceivable future for the United States. So, um, uh, but I thought your question about frustration at the increasing uh, constraints that bind the U.S. was interesting because I don't quite understand those constraints. I mean, I think this was something that was uh, was an attitude, a frustration, a there was a determination in the, in the George W. Bush administration to not be bound by these constraints, um, which was the idea that if we, if we got bound up in multilateral procedures, UN votes, um, that American power would not be able to do what it's necessary to do. Now, in the specific case of Iraq, I actually think, and this is a long story, but I actually think the sort of hybrid combination of a whiff of American unilateralism, um, but working through the UN system, actually put us at a point on the eve of the Iraq war where this combination worked very well. And I remember Jacques Chirac gave a, an interview to the New York Times where he said as much. American saber rattling and sort of unilateral in, uh, instinct had helped get inspectors back into Iraq. Uh, and uh, the problem was that the, you know, the United States was not able at that point to take yes for an answer, as in my view. Uh, so I don't, I don't really, the, the America is so powerful that multilateralism is, is an enabler rather than a, bind, a, a, a limit on American power. That's, that's my wet, wet liberal view. Um, how to deal with a nuclear Iran? Well, I, I, um, we had a session about this yesterday, and I really agreed with what everybody said, including my, my colleague, Mark Fitzpatrick. I'll, I'll just make one rather perhaps uh, unexpected comment. I would not, I, I, without saying what I think the United States should do, I would not be surprised, I would not be shocked to see the United States in a second Obama administration take military action against the Iranian program under certain circumstances. Israel. Um, well, you know, the Obama administration um, felt that the, um, as, as difficult as it was to reach an Israeli-Palestinian peace agreement and without necessarily feeling that it was within reach, that there was one very tangible thing that Israel could do that would, um, would change the climate and would, be good and, and would be not bad for Israel anyway, which was to freeze settlements. And it asked uh, very, um, very insistently for this. It demanded it. And Israel said no. Now, you can fairly ask, what was Obama thinking? I mean, was he too infatuated with the sound, with the magic of his own voice, that he didn't have a plan B for what, to ha what would happen when Israel said no? I don't really know the answer to that. Um, but I do think that um, Israel has done itself and has done its ally, the United States, a, a disservice. And uh, the future of American-Israeli relations is not going to be destroyed by this because, as, as Bob Blackwell said, I mean, American support for Israel will continue to be deep. Um, and you could describe it as unconditional. I don't know. I mean, I think that the United States has made very clear uh, what it believes Israel should do. Um, 
and I hope it continues to make that clear. Uh, first, uh, Jean-Louis' uh, question, uh, if uh, the defense spending patterns in Europe persist, which I think most people believe will, they will, um, I think the United States over the next decade will begin to think of NATO as an old folks home, which it visits from time to time, uh, and um, maybe has a maiden aunt there, but it doesn't want to put the maiden aunt out of her misery, but certainly doesn't think the maiden aunt is going to do any lifting or any work. Um, and uh, so if the Europeans wanted to take the lead in refashioning NATO, um, I think an American administration would probably lie back and think of England. Uh, it wouldn't be uh, compelled. Uh, on China, I, uh, the, uh, that question about the United States and China, I, I just say this, and the last session discussed China uh, at length. It's the biggest diplomatic challenge the United States has for the next couple of decades, is to try to manage its relationship with China in a way that promotes international stability. And whether that'll be possible or not, we don't know. Uh, there's been uh, extraordinary continuity in American policy toward China over uh, decades now. Uh, but uh, So I agree with uh, that, that question. Um, uh, Israel, the latest polls show that the turbulence in the Arab world following the revol revolutions has strengthened Israel's standing in the United States as they see the Israeli embassy in Cairo burning. It strengthens the Israeli role. On Iran, uh, I hope that the next president and I think it will come to this with the next president, does not face the binary choice of either attacking Iranian nuclear uh, facilities, which would be uh, a catastrophe, or not attacking Iranian nuclear facilities, which would be a catastrophe. So I hope uh, the track we're on now toward that binary choice will change. The last point I wanted to say, I very much liked Phillips' presentation, but if I could just revise and amend two sentences. The first one you said was, the U.S. will draw back from the world. I would suggest that be amended to, the U.S. will draw back from land wars in Asia, which is an entirely different notion. You said the U.S. is weary of foreign entanglements. I would say the U.S. is weary of land wars in Asia. And I would just point out that, and I'm going to just list them only, that the Obama administration, whether you like its policies or not in, in the areas I'm about to name, and some of them I think are fine, some of them I don't happen to agree with personally, but that's beside the point, is in the lead internationally with respect to the Middle East peace process, what the West should do about the Arab revolt, what, how to deal with the rise of Chinese power, how to promote India's rise, what to do about Afghanistan, what to do about Pakistan, what to do about the Russian reset, and so forth. So there's hardly any American retrenchment going on. Uh, there is a wish to withdraw from the land wars in Asia. And um, I think if there's eventually American retrenchment, and there could be, or it will be over the longer term. You won't see it, it seems to me, uh, for many years in the future, just because of the enormous power that the United States has. So I think talks, discussions about relative decline may be mesmerizing, but are analytically empty. Um. I'm not going to engage in a, 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 a debate about uh, uh, the relativities, but um, uh, I suppose uh, it depends, America's retreat or not, from a European perspective, depends on one's expectations and hopes for what America might have done. 
as much as uh, for its power. Um, I, I was just very struck on, the, on NATO and the European side by a conversation I had uh, with an American administration official who I've known for a long time, who's very pro-European Atlanticist, um, before the Libya campaign and just before Obama uh, administration flipped, which it did very late in the game. And uh, this chap was expressing his irritation at uh, David Cameron's sort of public speeches and demands for the for the U.S. and uh, to sort of take a lead. And he said. Uh, if your prime minister wants to rattle sabers, why doesn't he get his own saber? Um, and then he added, hasn't he just abolished your armed forces? Now, that's a bit extreme, but if you look at what Britain has done in its so-called strategic defense review, and I underlined so-called when applied to the strategic, it implies a, a serious, I think, retreat from uh, uh, any global pretensions. So I, uh, I subscribe to the view that uh, NATO is going to become, as I think Bob put it brilliantly, uh, an old people's home. No one will want to really close it down, but it's not going to be there. Um, I mentioned China simply because I'm, I'm not at all an expert on China, but every time I meet with uh, uh, people